Hello everybody and welcome to the third installment of Foreign Entanglements, a foreign policy oriented uh, program here on Blogging Heads. My name is Dr. Robert Farley of the Patterson School of Diplomacy and International Commerce at the University of Kentucky and with me today is Heather Holbert, um, who almost all of you will know, of the National Security Network. Uh, how are you doing today, Heather? Good, thanks. Does this count as my re-debut or anything like that? Yeah, I think I, we can count it that way. I mean, we can count it any way we want. I mean, I, you know, put it on your CV or your resume and something else. You've appeared on Blogging Heads, and you've appeared. Listen, I'm, I, I have, I have myself down on my CV as senior editor now. So oh, excellent. You know, whatever you want to, whatever you want to put down is fine with me. Um, That's true. I think I want to be senior pundit. I want a title senior that pun has pundit in it. Right, although right, I would right, settle for a title that had pandit in it, which is also good, but. Right. I mean, pundit is something like, you know, pundit is something, you know, senior is way too bureaucratic for something like pundit, right? You need something almost medieval and feudal um, for pundit, like grand pundit, grand pundit. or, um, you know, pundit of the West or something <laughs> like that. But, um, anyway, today, at this episode of uh, Foreign Entanglements, we're going to be talking about um, potential, well, we're going to talk, be talking about the international nets that are constricting or that appear to be constricting around uh, Iran and Syria. We're going to talk about Syria, or we're talking about Iran first. Um, now Heather, you wrote um, an interesting post that sort of um, gave like five or six connected thoughts on what the international situation with regards to Iran looked like right now. Um, you you um, linked to the recent article in the New York Times about why Israel might strike Iran, and we talked a little bit about the um, a little bit about um, other diplomatic efforts with regards to Iran. So, um, I guess my first thought is, well, I mean, what's your what is your um, thinking about how the situation uh, with regards to the United States and Iran and Israel stands right now? Well, actually, the reason I wrote that blog post was I was I was prepping for a, a talk that I gave um, on Iran on a congressional panel, which you can find at the website of MPAC, uh, which we'll post the link to, which, by the way, to my shock and surprise, was standing room only, 75 people. Um, let's just say standing room only audiences are not a, a frequent feature of, of work mm -hmm. in, the, in the progressive national security field. Um, so, you know, number one, sort of the good news is lots of people are really seized with this. And number two, as, as I was preparing for it, I actually started to feel a little bit less negative and concerned, not unconcerned, but there are more good things happening than one, if all one did was read that New York Times Magazine article, one might, one might conclude. So, for example, the same guy who wrote that article uh, gave an interview to Laura Rosen at Yahoo in which she said, you know, in uh, Hebrew we have this saying, hold me back so I don't hit anybody, and that's what I think is going on here, which is, you know, a much more optimistic um, point of view on why Israel's government is saying some of the things it's saying than, than what she saw in the article. Um, you had an economist analysis of the Chinese position saying, you know, ultimately China is not going to choose Iran over stability of oil markets and regional stability. So, you know, that's a that's a, a hopeful long-term um, harbinger. And then you had, before that article and after that article, lots of serious people, um, Israeli uh, retired diplomats and military folks, Anne-Marie Slaughter, Jim Fallows at The Atlantic, Steve Call at The New Yorker had a great piece, you know, laying out how um, various pieces of diplomacy are, in fact, coming together. So, you know, on the one hand, I think I'm not panicky right now. Um, on the other hand, what really concerns me and where I think we need to be going is that all it takes is one misunderstanding, one miscalculation, or one faction inside Iran who think it would be a really good idea to start a conflict. Um, and I think we'd be in one, and it would be very hard in this political climate where, and this is the last thing I'll say, you have political rhetoric that's totally divorced from the substantive developments I was just talking about. It would be incredibly hard and damaging for an administration to say, you know what, um, this hardline faction in Iran is trying to goad us into going to war with them because they think it would benefit them and we're not going to give them what they want. Right. So that's what I, so that's what I worry about. Okay, I, I, I'm hoping uh, that I did not just miss the audio in the first um, 20 minutes of this, so we're going to, or for four minutes of this, so we're going to proceed as if I didn't. Um, I don't want to, okay, um, So, a couple things that you mentioned I think are particularly interesting. I mean, one is um, this notion that, um, that uh, there might be some actors in Iran who would take this and say, this would be a great time to you know, launch a war and then we would sort of be stuck in a, in a 
pretty unpleasant situation. Um, I guess part of my question here, don't articles like the one that appeared in the Times and Jeffrey Goldberg's article that appeared like 20 months ago that said Iran was going to attack or could be attacked in 18 months, um, and then the, like the, the Halibi Oran article from 2007 that said Iran was going to be attacked in 18 months. Um, I mean, at what point do we essentially create this situation where some organizations within, within Iran get such twitchy trigger fingers because people are continuously making arguments that attacks against Iran are imminent, right? I mean, isn't there a problem with that um, sort of in making Iran more nervous about being attacked? So what you're really saying is you want an excuse to go home and read The Boy Who Cried Wolf to your toddlers? Well, I can do that any time, but I mean, you, you see my point, right? I mean, well, to put it <laughs> yeah, in another I, phrase, but I do, I do think actually there's 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 a separate point there, right? And one mm, question right. is, if you're constantly being threatened, does that make you more likely to jump? And of course, you know, if you make that argument, then I think just for intellectual um, for intellectual. Um, Continuity, although this is going to make me unpopular, if you buy that line of argument, then you also have to buy that it's legitimate for the Israelis to have itchy trigger fingers because Ahmadinejad keeps saying he wants to annihilate them. So, you know, that that's an argument that if it's true, it's true both ways. But in addition to well, that... Well, I, mean, let, 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 I mean, let me let me step back. I mean, because I think that even sort of taking the most... And, uh, you know, I don't want to be unpopular either. I, I like being popular. Um, but... Even the most ungenerous reading of uh, Ahmadinejad's statements have never been along the lines of, you know, here's a specific time frame in which Iran is going to carry out the annihilation of Israel, right? And here's how we're going to do it, and so forth. Yet, um, every one of these articles, back to 2007, has numerous quotes from Israeli bureaucratic uh, officials, has numerous quotes from people in the Israeli government that are very specific in terms of time frame, that are very specific, you know, sometimes in terms of weapons and ordnance, um, in a way that, you know, although we can agree that Iran, you know, is not a good actor in this relationship, at the same time, we've never had anything, you know, nearly as specific in terms of how and when an attack will happen come out of the Iranian side as we are consistently getting coming out of the Israeli side. Well, but again, I mean, if, if you're an Iranian and you watch that, you know, you could also argue that you look at it and you say, yeah, these people aren't serious, I'm just going to ignore them and go right on what I'm doing. So, so right. I'm not sure, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure that has any, number one, I'm not sure that has any beneficial impact, and number two, I'm not sure whether specificity is an argument for more concern or less concern. You know, there is this argument that sort of the more you know, the less you say. But the other thing I wanted to say is that in addition to this dynamic of sort of deliberate hostile talk there is also it's it's very clear that the revolutionary guard is divided you know this is something that's come out in the last couple of weeks that you know there's there's factional infighting going on within the revolutionary guard there's an incredible struggle going on between Ahmadinejad and the supreme leader and with legislative elections right. next month so there's a lot of internal factions in Iran which want a lot of different things and which control different levers to get those things. And, you know, the, there are military levers both within the besiege and within the, the Revolutionary Guard that if they wanted to, you know, and then, you know, we go back to that crazy terrorist plot to blow up um, the Israeli and Saudi ambassadors in a restaurant in Georgetown. Um, which is really hard to take seriously, but if you, I mean, to my mind, the way, the only way I've been able to make sense of it is to think of it as part of a, a factional issue right. within Iran. So that is, to me, a very real concern, and it's a little bit separate from, you know, does the rhetoric create a trigger-happy environment? Right, right, right. Um, so about this, I, I think it's very interesting, sort of, as you point out, that um, how our, we are sort of simultaneously seeing a situation where, um, I mean, people who are really pretty observant of the Iran situation, which I think, you know, I mean, you and I are both pretty observant of it, um, are really seeing the net tighten around Iran. Um, and yet the public conversation in the United States seems not to capture that at all, right? Um, that there seems to be little understanding of, you know, sort of the impact that sanctions are making or how the sanctions regime is increasing or anything along those lines. I mean, is this just sort of a, um, is this an inevitable consequence of elite-driven foreign policy uh, or of the complexity of a sanctions regime versus um, a, uh, for lack of a better word, a war, um, where it's just very difficult to convey to people um, the extent of diplomatic effort that's already been made um, with regards to 
restricting Iran's um, freedom of movement in the Gulf? Um, I actually think it's not either of those things. The political Iran debate isn't about Iran. And so, consequently, it's not surprising that it doesn't move based on actual facts related to Iran. Um, the political debate around Iran is a rehash, in some ways, of the political debate around Iran in 2008. It's a debate about how America is in the world and how you signify strength. Um, and, you know, Obama, to some extent, won that debate in 2008, you know, for various reasons didn't pursue it very far with the Iranians, now finds himself in this situation. At the same time, the Republicans find themselves for the first time, for the first time in my lifetime, facing a president whose strongest numbers are on national security, and they've taken, right. you know, the, the sort of Karl Rove model, which when I say that I don't mean it dismissively, it's a very good model. You attack your opponent where he's strong, not just where he's weak, and they've looked for a place where they think, you know, they can go after his strength and, you know, they can attack him about not having, you know, only killed Osama bin Laden once instead of four or five <laughs> times. Right, right. So they go after this and it connects. Um, I think there's a, there's a superstructure, if you will, which connects um, Iran policy and perceived weakness with Israel and questions around support of Israel and um, ambitions, particularly in a primary environment, to reach um, Christian Zionists, as they're called, and with, to a lesser extent, ambitions of detaching um, Jewish Democrats from the Democratic Party. Um, and then the last thing is that in some groups, some areas, I think it even functions as a dog whistle for, you know, Obama's not really one of us and he's kind of a Muslim. So, so I, those are the reasons that you're having such a loud Iran debate. Um, if you look at, you know, at least Romney's advisors, you know, th those are people who, those are people who are working in the Bush administration when they decided not to have a military response to Iran. So they, they right. understand the substantive developments. Right, right, and, and it's also interesting that um, I mean, in terms, of, and uh, I guess it's kind of fascinating that in both I mean, the way this conversation has gone, that a lot of the rhetoric is generated um, because of domestic politics of both Iran and the United States. Um, you know, whether that leads to a later escalation is a different question, but at least rhetorically, it's driven by this competition between factions in Iran and this competition um, within the um, within at least right now the Republican primary, but that'll be com become competition within um, the general election. Um, I mean, it's also interesting, and I was I was thinking about this the other day about where exactly, in terms of foreign policy, there was going to be some sort of substantial differentiation between Romney and um, Obama with regards to foreign policy. And when you start thinking that way, it, it is kind of um, it, it becomes obvious why Iran is an issue because it's not as if Romney has come out against the pivot to East Asia or anything along those lines. Um, you know, he certainly came out against more defense cuts, but that's not a particularly popular position. Um, and so I think, as you suggest, I mean, the, that Iran is a way for Republican candidates to convey things that they've typically been very good at conveying, which are resolution, strength, toughness, American exceptionalism, and so forth, and hoping that those things will sort of will, will play out well. Um, but at the same time, I wonder if there's some, sort of, some degree of synergy um, between the domestic politics of Iran, the domestic politics of Israel, and the domestic politics of the United States to the extent that sort of hawkish factions in other three, all three countries uh, feed off each other in some fashion. Um, I mean, because we would have to understand the Iranian threat, um, or the threat by one of the Iranian factions to close the Straits of Hormuz as part of this factional fighting, right? That it was something that, you know, Iran was extremely unlikely to do. Um, but at the same time, it's something that certainly played to this constituency in the United States that is very hawkish on Iran, right? And so you have sort of a feedback situation here where the domestic politics are all affecting one another. Well, I'll, there's another example of that that I actually just heard um, at this hearing I did on Monday that was really fascinating, which is that the incident where the British embassy in Tehran was attacked, um, mm -hmm. at the time that was reported as the, the, the proximate cause for that being the Iran's irritation with British um, central bank sanctions. But um, an Iranian-American analyst actually argued that what had happened was that one Iranian faction had been working to get um, a British ambassador to come back to Tehran. And mm -hmm. another, uh, a hardline faction in parliament wanted to stop that from happening and thus um, whipped up these demonstrations that eventually uh, resulted in the attacks on the embassy, at which point, you know, most of what, most of the mission that was left there left. So, you know, that's a great example where, you know, I certainly assumed that that was all about Western actions and Iranian reaction, but that apparently it was primarily about a, a debate 
a debate in, inside. Um, I guess the other question that I, and I asked Dan Dresner this too back in December, so mm -hmm. viewers will roll their eyes because they've seen me do this before. But I do think there's a broader common theme about the inadequacy of our domestic political, of everybody's domestic political institutions to deal with big global challenges and, and big defects in the global system and the inadequacy of our domestic systems to deal with with anger and frustration and that you see right. that playing out in really different ways and you know certainly um, the Iranians by having an autocratic and repressive system have brought extra trouble on themselves but you know the Israeli system can't begin to contend with some of the internal challenges in Israel our system you know thank God we're both foreign policy people so we don't have to get into talking about that but Right, you know, right, but there, there is this broader systemic failure, and in a way, the, a specific crisis that we're struggling with. Um, I mean, and, and this actually gets to a, a bigger point, which is, so the best case scenario, right, is that um, P5 plus one talks um, among the UN Security Council permanent members, Iran and Germany, resume over Iran's nuclear program in Turkey in the next few weeks. Um, mm -hmm. Iran will not be able to agree to anything because it's just before these elections and anybody who agrees to it will go home and get it yanked out from under him as, as happened in, in 2009. Then right. in the U.S. and Israel are able to say, look, see, we let you have another round of negotiations. It didn't produce anything, so now we have to bomb. And, you know, it's, it's very hard to see how, how our political dynamic, when, when the long-term solution is a solution in which you know Iran is an, still an important regional power. It still does some things we don't like. We cooperate on some common interests that we have, like stability in Iraq, like stability in Afghanistan, like minimizing um, Al Qaeda's ability to be a threat in the region, like keeping the open flow of oil. And we don't cooperate on other things because we have very different views on them. That's to go back to your earlier point. That's not an outcome that it's going to be very easy to put into our political environment. Right. So how on earth? Can we strengthen our system enough that it can live with sort of ambivalent, complicated, networked 21st century world outcomes? Right. I, I, it's a, it, I'm sort of sorting through everything you just said, and, and um, I mean, it's very, like for example, it's very easy for me to understand or to, to, to construct a narrative to why um, the U.S. system is not particularly well structured um, to modern foreign policy realities, to making modern foreign policy. Um, you know, on the one hand, it's a very old system. Um, it's a system for a country which, you know, for a very long time could survive pretty much not caring what anybody else did. Um, the entire system was revamped in 1947 to sort of completely um, retool and, and structure to, to play to a different kind of foreign policy. But now we're in a completely different environment, right? Um, I mean, it's a separate question of whether we want to revisit 1947 and rebuild our foreign policy institutions again. I mean, the our idea, though, that everybody's system is sort of flawed in the same way, I find very interesting, right? I mean, why would why would every country, especially countries that foreign relations are sort of much more critical to their direct day-to-day -day survival, um, like, for example, Israel, I mean, why would their system be so poor at being able to handle basic foreign policy reality. Um, and maybe it's, you know, I guess there are just a ton of different answers to that question that would have to be, you would have to think of in terms of or political culture and um, sort of the structure of the country when it came together and its relations with its immediate neighbors, which always sort of lead it to be um, at least antagonistic on both sides. That's a really interesting question, though. And I can't really think sort of straight off the top of my head how um, any of the countries could be reformed to suddenly become better foreign policy citizens. I mean, I guess within this formulations, are there any countries that you think of that that seem to have a government that is well structured to dealing with modern globalization? Damn, I was going to ask you that. Um, <laughs> but I actually, I can think of a couple, and this isn't um, this isn't very it isn't very salutary and positive. Um, so the uh, first place that comes to mind um, is the United Arab Emirates. Mm -hmm. Right, because that government can basically hire the smartest people it wants to figure out what to do and then do whatever it wants. And right. that I don't. I'm not saying I like that as a model, but it does. Um, it does work pretty well for them. So, so mm -hmm. sort of one governments that still have the ability to completely insulate the public from foreign policy decision making in a way that you know the Europeans used to have. 
we used to have more of than we do now. Um, I mean, I would argue, by the way, that that's the common thread among countries with very different systems, that information technology expectations and globalization um, sort of make it much harder to, to keep to keep your foreign policy decision making and your public away from each other. Um, I right. mean, what I'm now trying to think of is, is there a democratic system that's handling this stuff well? Um, uh, the Scandinavian countries, maybe? I mean, they seem to have, um, I don't know, a, a common foreign policy vision, and they seem to be able to execute at least elements of that vision. Yeah, that, that's, that's interesting. I mean, of course, some of them are now ensnared in the euro. Um, it, it's right. actually, it's funny. I was in Denmark a few weeks ago and, and I had the good fortune to get to meet the new Danish um, prime minister and um, finance minister who were both uh, women who were more or less my peers, which was very interesting. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, here they are. They're not in the euro. Um, they've had conservative by Scandinavian government standards for a number of years. This is the most left government that Denmark's had in quite a while. And ironically, they're the president of the EU right now, so they have to try to save the euro that they don't belong to for the good of Europe. Right. So I guess in that sense, you know, you could, you could argue that that's an extremely high-functioning polity. <laughs> right, right, um, right. Well, but, it, I mean, it's also interesting because... Um, the structure of European Euro Union foreign policy, um, the way at, le at least it's thrown together now, is pretty fundamentally disconnected with any sort of popular beliefs about foreign policy in any of the constituent countries, right? I mean, there's so many layers between um, the common foreign and security policy and the actual attitudes of actual Europeans um, that you could even imagine um, the European Union itself, at least on sort of its narrow foreign policy aspects, as being a relatively capable foreign policy actor. Although I guess you would also need some sort of executive um, to handle that as well. Yeah, so, and I mean, there have been a number of disasters in recent months. I mean, disasters from the point of view of unity. I'm not, not saying policy-wise, but, right. you know, you had Germany on Libya, and you have now France, you know, sort of undermining Afghanistan, Sarkozy undermining Afghanistan policy for election right. purposes. So in point of fact, the EU, you know, is nowhere near having an effective common foreign policy. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I think that's interesting is, you know, where Europeans are really angry about a, a, the democratic deficit is on, you know, sort of more internal issues. And, and right. I was actually curious about something you said, because my impression is that while a European citizen has very little control over European foreign policy, much actually less control than an American citizen does, um, it's actually not that discordant with what you see in European public opinion surveys, or am I am I wrong about that? Wait, so um, uh, so a European, the, so the CFSP is not that discordant with. So, um, for what example, you see the, in the decision to to um, to downplay Europe's military capacities, the mm -hmm. commitment to a much higher per capita level of official development aid than you see in this country, the um, the modulated position on Israel Palestine, which is um, you know different from the U.S.'s but not the same as many developing countries. The right. uh, quality of relationship with Russia, although of course you have to at some point differentiate regionally in Europe, but, yeah. but it's not like it's not like that's wildly out of step with what Europeans actually want from their foreign policy. I believe, although I I'm no longer much of an expert on European public opinion, if I ever was. Right, right. No, I mean I think that's I think that's it's fair to make that claim, um, which would then sort of get us. I mean. It might be accidental, right? And I would, in fact, be inclined to think that it's probably accidental um, that you have those outcomes. And so, I mean, but then, you know, sort of similar, you, you could... You Only could if you define think, culture as an accident, right? Right. Well, the but you, what you would have would be, I mean, how, how, how you would phrase it potentially would be an accidental combination of culture and institutions when it's it's actually hard to tell the story of how the institutions attach to the culture, right? Um, when you can tell that story, but but I mean, with like individual European states, and we are we're sort of getting into the weeds here. Individual European states have certainly undertaken foreign policies that are dramatically at odds with the popular consensus um, in their countries, right? I mean, when we have to think about Italy and Spain, and in the case of the Iraq War, and so forth. Um, yeah. Whereas the CFSP is just sort of so institutionally tied up that it just happens to do the same thing as what the sort of more general 
European poll polling is. So actually, anyway, that might be a good ahead, pivot. Go that might be a good pivot to Syria mm -hmm. and responsibility to protect. Actually, we we, right, right, we right. save ourselves from from wandering in the weeds of of, of European um, public right. opinion. Um, and you 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 know you have you had this fascinating debate on Syria at the UN earlier in the week. I guess now they're talking about a vote either Friday or next week. The Russians are still making veto noises. Um, there's a lot of invoking of the lessons of Libya for better for worse. Um, you know, whither the responsibility to protect, does it have a future, and whither Assad. We were, before we got on the call, um, you know, you were saying that you just finished up a book on air power, and I made a snarky remark about air power in Libya, but, but let's talk about it. The idea that you could do, um, the idea that you could do a skies only, no fly zone intervention in Syria. Um, talk about it from the air power perspective, Dr. Farley. Right, right. I mean, well, uh the first thing you have to do is sort of discard, discard the idea, and we discarded this very quickly in in, um, in Libya, of course, that a no-fly zone is a, is something about you know the enemy or the target country not being able to fly, right? Um, I mean, the Syrian armed forces are not really using their air assets in any sort of counterinsurgency uh, manner right now. Maybe because they're afraid of a no-fly zone, um, but it's you know it's not terribly likely that. Um, their effectiveness would be hampered, um, even if we prevented them from using one of our aircraft. So, um, what we're thinking about in terms of Syria, if we were to put it into the um, Libyan model, would be, and I think Anne-Marie Slaughter had um, an article that was sort of ambivalent about intervention in Syria, but was sort of like positively ambivalent. Um, and what you would have uh, if you intervened in Syria with just air power is that I mean, you would have an, an enclave situation. You would have a situation where particular cities or particular enclaves would be protected by Western air power, and it would have to be more than just no-fly zone. It would have to be um, direct attacks against Syrian armed forces units um, to prevent them from, from dominating or attacking these particular enclaves. Um, and it's not that air power can't do that, because air power sort of can, um, but that would also involve a massive and widespread set of attacks against um, Syria's uh, coordinated air defense network. Um, you would, you would quite. Can you just pause and say which is located in urban areas and would result in the deaths of civilians? Because people often sure, don't yeah. don't understand that until it's explained. Yeah, absolutely. Like basically, I mean, yeah, basically, we're we're blowing up a bunch of um, you know communications networks and surface to air missile zones and, and stuff where people live around where people live. Not all of them where people live, but some where people live. Um, I suspect that every single air force uh, and aviation commander would also insist that the Syrian air force be basically destroyed, um, and so you would have almost certainly see a widespread set of attacks on Syrian airfields around the country, um, which would also produce casualties. I mean, I, I, on an entirely, or not entirely, but a digression, um, you know, people who are in the Syrian armed forces who die in airstrikes are, are also people, right? I mean, they, they have families at home, they have mothers and fathers, right? Someday they're going to retire, they're going to go and do stuff. So even to the extent you're killing maintenance workers and pilots at Syrian air bases, you're still killing people, and it's still a genuine cost of war that we have to take seriously. Um, and so what you have is a, a very intensive air operation that is certainly more intensive than we had in Libya, where there wasn't really a professional army, and where um, there was um, sort of geographically it was very easy to manage confrontations between, um, between the loyalist forces and the rebel forces. Um, you would probably have something that would be even more intensive and um, and uh, uh, intrusive than the situation in Serbia, um, because again there would be there would be um, there would be the need to carry out widespread direct attacks on Syrian armed forces in order to preserve these enclaves. And the fun, fun the interesting thing about Syria is or Serbia is that. We, of course, were not able to protect the enclaves. Uh, I mean, the Serbs were dramatically successful at clearing um, the people they didn't want out of the enclaves that they wanted to take. Um, and it was only later, um, after the Serbs gave up. Um, and a reason why that's less likely to happen in this situation is because the Serbs, in fact, could give up Kosovo in 1999. That was something they could do. Assad cannot give up himself, right? I mean, the Syrian government will not wish itself out of existence. Um, and so you have, you have a template for a very long, very intensive, very intrusive air campaign against a much more capable enemy than we faced since Serbia. Um, it will be the most 
capable enemy that we faced since Serbia, um, and that could lead to long-term stalemate and intervention. Right? It's worse than Iraq in terms of the no-fly zones after 1991. Um, it's a really difficult situation, and I don't think people quite grasp um, just how hard it would be to maintain um, a air-driven intervention in Syria so, if the country didn't collapse. Yeah, so the, the point that I make on all of that is, first of all, um, Syria has the third largest army in the region after Israel right. and Egypt. Um, right. Second, you know, so that army can be just about everywhere. So I am quite skeptical of the idea that you could even establish enclaves from the air, much less right. if I had it just, I don't think you could defend them from the air. You know, I think the one thing that you could do, which the Turks have made it really clear they don't want to do, and there are excellent reasons for the Turks not wanting to do it, is try to establish an enclave along the Turkish border. And there were calls from some Syrian oppositionists for Turkey to do that, but that raises all kinds of Ottoman Empire specters. The Turks have said explicitly we're not going to be NATO's subcontractor. So I'm, I'm a person who's um, quite willing to be pro-humanitarian intervention, but you have to have a convincing plan for how it's going to do more good than harm, and for all the reasons you've, you've laid out, I still haven't seen one for Syria. More to the point, um, you know, there's a reason that the Arab League went to the UN and requested, you know, this strong resolution asking Assad to step aside and all these other things, sanctions, but not requesting military intervention because it's their assessment that it would denigrate, disintegrate into a regional civil war, and right. we don't want that either. Right. Um, what is your um, what is your assessment of Russia's position on Syria? I mean, we know that Russia is not going to allow any sort of very strong um, 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 uh, resolution to pass the UN Security Council. Um, but what's Russia's angle? I mean, they seem to be making very high and very leveraged bets on Assad's survival. Um, you know, they recently had this major sale. I mean, and by recently, I mean like last week major sale of aircraft to Serbia, or not to Serbia, I'm sorry, Syria, um, to Syria that, um, you know, they might deliver aircraft but never get paid by a new government that hates them because they were so friendly with Assad. Um, I mean, what's your sense of, of how, how and why the Russians are playing Syria the way that they are? Well, I mean, my first question is, do we know they didn't demand and get cash up front? <laughs> Um, I mean, I don't. I don't think that they did. I think it was. I think it was some sort of long-term payment plan. Yeah. Um, no, uh, look, I mean, I'm not 100. Russia on that, so sees that itself answer. as a Middle East power, as a Middle East player. Um, Russia needs a client state in order to be a Middle East player. Um, Syria has been that country. You look around. You can't really find another good candidate for them. Um, so if Assad goes, you know, they lose not just what's been a very lucrative arms market, but they also lose, you know, their foothold to be a serious regional player, to have a reason to be at the table, you know, for example, in the quartet, in the, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian talks. Um, you know, that there's all kinds of larger prestige reasons, but also just, you know, very um, specific commercial ties. Then I think there are two other things that play into it. One is that if um, the UN can pass if the UN can push Russia into supporting or abstaining on a strong resolution on Syria, that has interesting implications for Iran and puts Russia in another tight corner regarding another client state. Um, and then, you know, you look at what's happening in Syria, you look at the levels of violence, you look at the levels of ethnic fragmentation, um, and it might remind you of Chechnya and not just because, you know, there was a Chechen uh, um, out-migration to there was a Caucasian out-migration to that part of the Middle East. So, you know, somewhere in the backs of the minds of Russian policymakers is always what kind of precedent is this setting for our own um, challenging borderland regions. All right. Um, you know, what, what do you think is the, the relation between the, um, what we're calling the emerging global norm of responsibility to protect and uh, the United Nations Security Council. Um, you know, obviously there have been operations in the past that we would classify, maybe in hindsight, as responsibility to protect operations, and I'm thinking most notably of Kosovo, um, that did not get the approval of the Security Council. Um, I mean, is, when we think about R2P as an international norm, does Syria and do other 
situations like Syria allow us to think about it in terms where R2P is a responsibility that falls upon particular countries or particular organizations which are not necessarily the United Nations, right? I mean, if the United Nations fails, can we make an argument generated by R2P that other countries thus have the responsibility to pick up where the UN fails, or is the UN our arbiter of what, of when this responsibility exists or not? So this is going to be a largely political argument that's going to be very unsatisfactory to the, the legal the legal theoreticians in the audience. But so first of all, um, as if international law isn't political, right? I mean that yeah. Yeah. That's okay. Well, thank yeah. you. I appreciate that. Um, first of all, um, you know the norm is very clear. That the responsibility to protect is first and foremost domestic. Sovereignty brings with it the responsibility to protect your citizens, and it's right. only when you fail to protect people on your territory that any other country or organization comes into play. Um, there's an effort, and this is at the political level and not at the sort of legal norm level, to then create a hierarchy where it's your neighbor's responsibility, it's the region's responsibility next, um, mm -hmm. reflecting, I think, you know, both the, the desire not to have the UN overwhelmed, the desire to use non-coercive means as often as possible, and the desire to have the maximal legitim legitimacy when you do need to use um, coercive means. So, you know, for example, in the case of Syria or Libya, that means how does the Arab League desire to see the situation resolved? And then from that level, you go to the UN because the UN Security Council is, it's the best we've got as far as a global legitimator. Um, so then, you know, to your real question, what do we do when the Security Council is stuck? Um, and there I ask a really political question, which is what is the good of ignoring or going around the Security Council in terms of, of lives saved? versus the harm in terms of what it does down the road. And so, for example, Kosovo, right. you know, I was in government during Kosovo, and on the one hand, I do think we saved many lives. On the other hand, we made it a lot easier for Iraq to happen. Um, and so I personally wrestle with that, and I sometimes wonder whether whether it was worth it. Um, Libya... Well, in addition to things like Abkhazia and South Ossetia yeah, and so forth, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, although, actually... Hadn't both of those happened? Yeah, both of those had happened before, or bad things had right. already happened in both Abkhazia right. and South Ossetia before. Before, but it, rest it restructured Russian rhetoric about those, two, yes. perhaps, and yeah. potentially hardened the Russian position on those two, to those two uh, bond claims. Yeah, yeah. Um, but and then you know, I mean, another thing that I you know think is it's as in, so with Libya, you have Security Council Council authorization. Um, you have a lot of frustration that there wasn't maybe as much information flow from NATO as there could have been, and you have some frustration which you can also say is a little self-interested about, oh, NATO exceeded the mandate. You know, it's interesting, the exchange you and I had about when you talk about taking out air power defenses, you're talking about, you know, hitting installations in neighborhoods where people live, and there was a lot of sort of willful disregard of that fact, which any any Air Force officer would have told, would tell you. Um, so, you know, similarly, you have the question of kind of what's the norm, and then you have what implication is how you choose to observe or not observe the norm going to have the next time you want to save lives, which gets us back to our, you know, the boy who cried wolf problem. Right, right, right. Uh, right. What's your answer? My answer to the R2P thing? Yes. Or, um, I mean, I guess... The problem I see with R2P is is essentially the the Russian problem with it, and it's it's the it's um, that I mean especially when we even when we start where um, you started, which is to suggest sort of we start on a we start at the domestic level, okay, fine. Then we move to a neighborhood level. Um, I mean that fits so easily into, and I'm yeah, it fits so easily into how the Russians rhetorically portrayed what they were doing in South Ossetia and Georgia, right? Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not a Georgia booster, um, but it, it's, it's also, you know, fairly clear to me that the Russians abused the logic of R2P um, sort of in order to um, escalate a conflict in that region, right? But do you really um, think that they wouldn't have done exactly the same thing without having R2P to pretend to invoke? I mean, I don't think it changed sure. what they did at all. Sure, but the rhetoric matters, right? I mean, the, the, rhetoric, the rhetoric itself matters, well, and how, and how they use the rhetoric, rhetoric matters. Matter. <laughs> right. Um, 
how they use the rhetoric matters. It matters sort of in longer term um, appreciations of the legitimacy of their actions. Um, it makes it it makes it harder to sort of generate critiques. I mean, even the Russians are sensitive to critiques, right? They're sensitive to these sorts of arguments, um, and. You know, we always come down to this, well, did this norm actually make a difference or did it just cover whatever this great power wanted to do? And, and maybe in South Ossetia, it just covered what the great, great power wanted to do. But, you know, they use the rhetoric because they see a utility in using that rhetoric, right? Um, and, and China intervening in, you know, potentially in one of its neighbors in a similar situation um, might be able to use a, a similar rhetoric. And we, I mean, we'll never quite know where the borderline cases are. Um, in terms of is this rhetoric that actually really genuinely enabled um, one power to um, to intervene in another when it otherwise wouldn't have, or is it something that just you know, was completely up a phenomenal? Well, let me um, let me offer a couple positive cases on that though, okay. because you know one um, that two, well neither of them really gets talked about very much out outside of R two P circles, which sounds mm -hmm. wonderfully weird and and um, and um, eclectic, but um, one is Cote d'Ivoire where you had had a kind of, unfortunately, not maximally effective international peacekeeping operation that hadn't been able to install the legitimately elected government. And then after the R2P debate over Libya, you had new willingness to, you know, frankly, let France go in and help the mission out, which, you know, would have been seen right. as un inadmissible colonialism beforehand, but which did actually produce the desired result. And then the other case, I mean, which is even better because it doesn't involve use of force, is Kenya where there was a, dis a contested election and, and quite a bit of violence afterwards, and there was a lot of intervention by various uh, governments and international personalities to kind of calm the situation down and broker and broker a solution under the, the R2P label. And so, you know, I, those are both cases where the existence of the R2P label produced positive results um, that we might not have been able to get the quality and speed of international intervention that we got, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, frankly, because they're, they worked well nobody, and they didn't involve a lot, you know, they didn't involve U.S. air power, so nobody notices them. Right. I mean, was there any, I mean, ha have there been invocations of R2P in terms of Ethiopian and Kenyan behavior towards Somalia? I mean, I, I, I know at least the Somalis have, have, have hinted at it, haven't they? And, and I'm not sure the, the Ethiopians in 2007, or is it 2007? I can't yes, remember. I think so. Um, like, made a, an explicit R2P argument, but, but they were certainly making arguments that were um, complementary with R2P, yeah. right? I confess to such cynicism about Ethiopian motives that I have not sort of watched their rhetoric carefully. But ag right. again, I, you know, who's, who, the hard truth of that one is who's going to stop the Ethiopians? Right. Right, well, but, but, uh, but again, I mean, I think that the rhetoric matters in terms of sort of the larger international reaction and, and the, the longer term international reaction. I mean we, we can't we can't just say that RTP is a norm that only matters for good countries in good situations, right? Um, and that whatever the bad countries were going to do, they were going to do anyway. Um, I mean there have to be or at least there may be borderline cases where R2P gives a country the chance to intervene where it really wants to anyway, um, that they wouldn't have taken before, but because they now perceive to have a protection. Um, okay, but I think you've just, I think you've actually, you've just, we've just arrived at the criteria, which is that mm -hmm. there's an enormous difference between a case where one country goes ahead and does something totally unilaterally and then calls it R2P, and a case where a number of countries try to get um, international sanctions. So multilateral, right. multilateral, so, so multilateral. So yeah, I think, although you know, you could you could argue about um, about the invasion of Cambodia to to, to get. I was just going to bring that up. I was just going to bring that up. Right, where where you have a country here which is pretty unpopular, um, right, invading a country which had the political protection of two other giant countries maybe for its own reasons, but also something that would clearly be justified by R2P, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, right? And unilateral is the only way it could have ever, ever have happened. Right, right, and and to which no maybe we can just apart. say, well, thank God we don't live in the Cold War anymore. <laughs> but but I think, I, I do think you can argue that it's... I don't, have you seen Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy? Yes, it I have. So made me miss the Cold War. I made me it's miss so John le Carré and his ambivalence, period. I, now, I, I loved the novel, and I loved that movie, and I really dislike a lot of the post, you know, the, the beauty of Le Carre was that he 
was he embraced full-throatedly um, ambivalence about a conflict that you weren't supposed to be ambivalent about. And it was I was I was so thrilled. I remember vividly discovering his work as a teenager and how much I loved it. And then reading, um, I can never remember the name of it, but the one that's the drug company in Africa one. And you know everybody's a cartoonish good guy or bad guy. And I'm just like, where's all that wonderful ambiguity that you used to approach the world with? Right. But for those who haven't right. seen the movie, Gary Oldman is incredible. He's amazing. I've, I've had so, I've, I, I've had arguments with some people who really prefer the Alec Guinness. Um, in the miniseries, I don't know if you've seen the miniseries, but o I, I think Oldman's performance was really just staggering. I mean, I thought he was astounding yeah. as a, as a, as a um, smiley. Yeah. But, well, on that note. Um, well, yeah. I mean, I think we we said that we were going to hang out around forty-five minutes, and we're at about forty-five minutes right now. So, I mean, I think we've had a productive con yeah with bonus movie conversation review. about bombing various Middle Eastern countries and why we would or would not do that. So. Um, so, I mean, do you have anything else to add? Um, no, I'm trying to think of a movie that we could promise to review next time, but um, I'm not coming. <laughs> well, up. Homeland. Have you watched Have you watched Homeland, the series, on Showtime? No, I haven't. I confess. The, right. Now, if you have the chance, um, you may like it, you may not. Um, but there are productive and interesting comparisons between the way intelligence work is portrayed in Homeland and the way it's portrayed in a Cold War uh, approach like, say, the British show Sandbaggers or Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. Hmm. Hmm. Um, and so, if you have, you know, 14 hours to kill, <laughs> kill, kill them in that fashion. <laughs> when I have 14 hours to kill, I will let you know. All right. Thanks well, a lot. Th thank Good you night. so much. Thank you. And Foreign Entanglements viewers, thank you for tuning in one more time. We will be back next week. I believe... No, I won't tell you. It'll be a surprise. I'll let it be a surprise. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks very much.